I got asked this question uh, two times over the course of, of two days in different formats, uh, both by younger men, men under the age of 30, around one was 27, one was 29, around the issue of being honest and being open about the fact that you have problems and, uh, you know, you may have experienced some trauma in your life and there are some wounds that you're working on that you're working to heal, but without falling into the victim mentality trap, the victim mentality mindset. And um, I kind of feel like uh, this applies to everybody. It's not, it's not just advice for young men. Everybody will feel this or, or could feel this to some degree. So how... The question I would phrase it as is how do we behave? Like what's the appropriate way of approaching the issue? What's the attitude that we should have towards the issue so that we can be honest, we can be forthright, we can be adult without talking ourselves out of our own agency and out of our own sovereignty and avoiding the victimhood narratives. Now, in order to talk about this, there's something I have to address first. Uh, and I want to do it briefly. I don't want to go off on a big philosophical ramble. But the interesting thing here that I think is happening is because we are ingesting so much pre-masticated, which is, it sounds rude, but it just means chewed. It's not rude, it's chewed. Pre-masticated means already chewed up content. You don't have to read. You don't have to pick up a book. You don't have to think. You don't have to wrestle with it. It's just given to you. So we're being told what to think and how to think through our consumption of information, predominantly through channels like this on YouTube and Instagram and social media usage. The speed with which we can get access to information, I think, gives us a a false sense of, of what we know. So we're confusing being very informed with an ability to think. We're confusing being rapidly informed with having a grasp of the subject. Why am I saying this now? Be because what I personally observe, and this is my little philosophical preamble, endure me, endure this um please be patient with me don't endure me that's a weird thing to say endure me damn you endure this it'll be worth it this culture where we're up to now it's inducing an externalized locus of control so everything is thinking for you and i was listening to an interview the other day that was went one step further it was like it was talking about mainstream media news it doesn't just tell you uh, what to think it tells you how to think and beyond that now, it's actually telling us how to feel. And so we're outsourcing our thoughts, our cognitions, our emotions, and then we're outsourcing our behaviors. We're outsourcing the appropriate response. Richard, what has this got to do with the question? Just tell me, how do I be honest with myself about trauma and not fall, in, fall into this victimhood narrative? Well, the very fact that we need to ask this question, and this question is so appealing to so many people, is an indicator of a problem that's further upstream, which is, okay, so I start with me. How would I answer this question? There is no dichotomy for me. I don't feel as though in order to be honest about my pain or the fact that I'm dealing with wounds and I'm in therapy and I'm overcoming certain things, I don't feel at risk of falling into a victimhood narrative at all because I have strong boundaries internally, because I can think, because I wasn't raised with a mobile phone. I was raised to run away from the chaos in my household to a library and to spend time amongst books. So even if I wanted to be entertained and I just wanted to have my mind passively massaged, I couldn't use TikTok. I would have to go and read, you know, Lord of the Rings or other sword and sorcery books like David Gemmell and, and people like that. And that was, you know, 
that was what I was doing to relax. It's not elitism. It's not intellectual snobbery. I'm not saying, ha ha, I'm smarter than you. What I'm saying is we have to be aware of all the problems that are implicit within the problem in order to find a solution that will stick. Because I can sit here and say to you now, I can give you the Oprah Winfrey level, banal, trite aphorisms. Oh, you are a brave and strong warrior of mental health survival dumbs. Yay, mm, yummy, I feel nicey in my tummy wummies. Yay, poopily doobly, good. And then tomorrow you're depressed again. Good, but I did my job. Everybody's gonna pat me on the head and go, thank you for my little dose of serotonin. Thanks for my little dopamine release. I feel all yummy poopy pumpies about myself. Great, and nothing changes, nothing changes. In fact, I just made you sicker and weaker. Why? Because I just outsourced your happiness. I just outsourced your peace to me, me. I did it. Now I'm doing it. Now I'm the dildo that makes you feel better psychologically and emotionally speaking. Some of you are watching this and going, not psychologically and emotionally. You are actually a flipping dildo, mate. Do I, do I get demonetized for saying that? Probably. You can't, you can't say such words. Um, you have to be aware that like, if your mind is falling into these dichotomies, what Gad Saad calls epistemological dichotomania, the need to say, instead of having nuance and thinking for ourselves, we rely on ideological structures and ideological categories, um, ideological entities to hold our thoughts and our feelings for us, like a superstructure that we just vomit our internal stuff into and go, okay, now daddy, now mummy, you do it for me. I don't want to do that. I don't, I would rather lose everything. I would literally rather lose everything. How do I say this without using bad words? Than slurp the devil's dinkle. I don't think you can get in trouble for saying dinkle. I'm not slurping the devil's dinkle. I don't want to do it. I don't want to do it. I'm not doing it. I'll lose everything. I don't care. I don't care. I'll find another way. I'm not Oprah Winfrey. I'm not going to give you trite aphorisms. If you're sat there, what I'm trying to tell you is this. If you're sat there thinking, oh, my God, oh, my God, oh, my God. I want to tell the truth to myself and other people that, that, about the fact of who I am. And I am in pain and I am wounded. But as soon as I do that, I slip into the victimhood narrative. You lack. I'm sorry. I'm not here to make you feel good. I'm here to make you better. You lack internal boundaries and you're lacking an ability to think for yourself. Fact, fact, absolute fact. It's not a moral judgment. I'm not holding myself above you, but if you're my friend and I see that you're shoving the heroin needle in your arm and you're dying, I'm not going to go, Oh, that's, is that, did you get the needle in? Okay. Did you, is it nice smack? Yeah. You're high now. Oh, yay. I'm your mate. Yeah. Do you want me to go to the needle exchange and get you another nice fresh? I'm not doing it. I'm not doing it. There's no effing way I'm doing that. We have to learn to think. We must learn to think more clearly. People like me, little boxes on YouTube with talking heads aren't going to do anything for you. I, I can't save you. I'm not interested in saving you. I don't care. I'm not some super nice guy who has a, a martyrdom complex or a savior. I don't care. I'll save me. I'll maybe my friends and my family. I, I, I don't care. I'll tell you what works and you can go and do it or not. That karma isn't on me. That's not my karma. That's your karma. You must practice to strengthen this thing. And you must practice to strengthen this thing. I don't like anything that doesn't validate me 24 seven. Well, now you are an intellectual and emotional slob because you're mainlining comfort and validation all the time. And you cannot take negative feedback. You are weak. That is a weakness. You're never going to, you're not going to get better. You're not going to become a sovereign adult functioning out in the world like that. This must be disciplined and it must be trained. You must 
read. You must read books. You must read books that it hurts. Oh, it hurts. I have to think. You must. You must think. You must learn to think. You must practice some sort of philosophical discipline. There's no other way. There's no pill. There's no cute little mantra. There's no YouTube guru or Instagram post that's going to do this. It's not going to work. And you'll say to me, oh, this is just you in one of your moods. Uh, you know, you just like berating people. Okay. Okay. All right. Come, 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 come. Let's talk. You and me, we talk. Do you know anything about mental health? Many of you do. Many of you have like degrees worth of understanding to it to to maybe not to an academic level, but a degree's worth of understanding of mental health issues in niche areas like uh, personality disorders that people, actual academics, they don't bother with. I've told the story many, many times on this channel about psychiatrists I've spoken to who really didn't know that much about BPD. They really didn't know that much about PTSD. They really didn't know that much about secondary trauma. And I said this in the YouTube comments, like, this is nonsense. It couldn't possibly be true. There's no way that that's true. I'm like, the world is full of specialists. Of course, there are psychiatrists who know it inside out because they may have written papers on that. They may have specialized in that. But the idea that uh, psychiatry or psychotherapy as it's taught is gonna match your interests to, to a nuance is ludicrous, of course it isn't. There's so much other stuff to study in psychology. Psychology generally doesn't really care that much about the stuff that we talk about here or the stuff that you're watching, it doesn't care. But you know what BPD is, most of you. You know what complex post-traumatic stress disorder is. And many, but not all of you, will know what DBT is, dialectical behavioral therapy. What is the one new, one, one new format of therapy that has come out in the last 50 years that has been shown to be the most effective thing for one of the hardest personality disorders to treat, borderline personality disorder and complex post-traumatic stress disorder. I, I said that as though they're both personality disorders. Obviously, they're not. Don't be a nitpicker. Dialectical behavioral therapy does it. What does dialectical behavioral therapy teach us to do? What is it actually teaching us to do? It's teaching us fundamentally to accept, to be in the moment, to be calm, and to think more clearly and with more reason about these issues, there's no escaping it. There's no escaping it. I want to be forthright, back to the problem, back to the title. I want to be forthright and I want to be honest about the fact that I'm in pain. What would I be honest about? Uh, you know, childhood trauma. Sometimes I, I'm a workaholic. Sometimes I go to the gym and I train too hard because of underlying anxiety issues you know sometimes i deal with i deal with depression i've spoken about codependency issues before various elements of cptsd various elements of addiction so on and so forth i have problems i'm a human being on planet earth we all have problems facts just facts that's just the way it is it's a human thing. It's not a you thing. It's not a me thing. It's just a human thing. People are either aware that they have problems and they're working on them or they're in denial. There's no normals. There's nobody who's just fine. It's hard being here. It's hard being on this planet. It's hard being in this reality. It hurts. And we have a consciousness that is designed or has evolved in such a way that it can continue to hurt us unless we work with it. We have to discipline it. So you ask a question and I answer it. We go back. I've given you my philosophical preamble. We go back. I want to be honest and forthright about my problems, but I don't want to fall into a victimhood narrative. Okay. I want to learn how to run up a hill uh, for 60 seconds at a moderate to fast pace, but I never train my hamstrings. I never train my glutes. I never train my calves and I never run. Okay. That's a problem. You're trying to do a thing that you don't have training to do. You're trying to do a thing that you don't have the capacity to do. I want to talk about this, but I'm so overrun. It's not your fault. I'm not blaming anybody. I'm just telling you the way it is. I'm so overrun with 
stuff that happened in my childhood, stuff that happened in my adulthood with ongoing trauma and shame about that trauma that I'm carrying. The super ego injunctions are battering me every day. My inner critic is telling me I'm useless and I'm worthless. And now you're telling me I'm not thinking, oh my God, it's a nightmare. Okay. Can you do the thing that you're trying to do or not? No. Now let's just sit and breathe. Let the ego subside. I can't do it. Okay. No, I can't do it. No, I'm not perfect. Okay. I'm not perfect. And I can't do this. There's a thing I want to do, but I'm not trained to do it. And I can't do it. Wow. See how that feels when you don't fight. You see how that feels when you're not being neurotic? This is one of the major uh, uh, cornerstones of, of dialectical behavioral therapy as developed by Marsha Linehan for herself first, based on spending time in Buddhist meditation and Buddhist retreats. Cal surprise. What a flipping surprise that is. I want to be perfect. I have to be perfect and I can't do it. You know how many times I've sat with people in coaching and they'll cry tears of frustration and fury because I'm telling them you're missing this, you're missing this and you're missing this. And that they go, but I already did the work. I already did the therapy. And I'm looking at them going, you didn't, you showed up to therapy. You might have done some affirmations and burnt some candles and I don't know what you were doing, but you've not done the work because you can't do this. Can we accept that for now? Can we have the humility to accept that for now? I can't do this. I can't do this. Okay. Wow. This is happening in English. I'm talking to you in English. And, and even if English is uh, not your first language, you're probably thinking in English right now, but you didn't always know how to think English. You didn't always know how to turn a laptop on or a phone on. You learned it. You learned to walk. You learned to move. You've been learning things your whole life. This is just one more thing that you don't know how to do that you can learn to do. You're a learning machine. You're a highly successful learning machine. You've learned libraries full of stuff up until now. And this is one more thing to learn. It's not a big deal, but we have to start upstream of the problem or I'm gonna end up giving you trite aphorisms and Oprah Winfrey level stuff. And I'm not going to do that. I want to tell the truth about the pain I'm in. I want to tell the truth about the fact that I have things to work on without falling into a victimhood narrative. Why? So now I've given you your warm up. You're not going from cold. You've been given a warm up. So I can say this. Why would being forthright and telling the truth about the fact that you're in pain, be a victimhood narrative. Why? What have the two even remotely got to do with each other? Now I will help you. And please remember this part of the video, bookmark it, timestamp it. This is honest. This is honest. You're telling yourself the truth. This is what Freud most likely learned from Dostoevsky, from reading Dostoevsky. Freud said, Above all else, maintain a rigorous discipline of being brutally honest, at least with yourself. He probably got that from reading Dostoevsky's The Brothers Karamazov. It's one of the amazing, beautiful, life-changing lessons that you can draw from that book. I highly recommend you read it. This is honest. When I'm sat saying, at least to myself, I'm not perfect. I have neurotic I'm saying new, neurotic, not erotic, <laughs> neurotic responses to pressure, to stress, to scenarios. I'm not perfect. I'm still working on it. I have to go to therapy. I, I, I have to do weird journaling exercises and different exercises and things to discipline my mind and discipline my body in order to deal with these things. That's honest. I don't need to tell everybody this. I don't really tell anybody. I tell my therapist. There's no, who else needs to know? Like it's it, the most important conversation about this is me to me. It's not a virtue signal. It's not a t-shirt I'm wearing. It's not my identity. 
I'm not hashtag mental health. Do you know how much I loathe that? How cheaply people exploit this hashtag mental health thing. Mental Health Awareness Day, Men's Mental Health Awareness Day. You don't care. You don't care. And you're just using it. You're using other people's pain to make yourself look good. I loathe all that. I don't need to tell anyone, but me, my therapist, if I have a partner, maybe my partner needs to know at some point in the relationship because I'm going to be like, hey, got some intimacy issues. Oh, you got intimacy issues. Yeah, like every other human being alive on this planet. Every. Richard, you can't say every. Oh, I can. And I just did. I'll say it again. Every, every human has intimacy issues. Every human has intimacy issues. You don't have a problem. Oh, I have intimacy issues. So does everyone. Your mom has it. Your dad has it. Your mother's 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 mother had it. It's just part of being human. Don't let yourself be tricked by all of this externalizing and, and uh, um, instrumentalizing of who we are into believing these, these, false, uh, uh, these false standards of perfectionism. It's all nonsense. Nobody's got it fixed. Nobody's got it sorted out. You write in your comments who you think has it fixed and has got it sorted out, and I will show you a neurotic drug addict who's probably just faking it. Nobody's got it sorted out. It's chaos. It's fine. It's always been chaos. It's fine. Just look for peace in your life. So over here, here's your dichotomy. Here's a, here's a, a dichotomy not rooted in ideology, but is rooted in a sound moral philosophy. Here is honesty when I tell the truth about the fact that I'm not perfect and there's things I'm still working on. Here is dishonesty. The victimhood narrative is dishonest. It's depraved. It's degenerate and it's corrupt. Why? The victimhood narrative is solely for the purpose of manipulating other people through deception. It is deceptive. It is manipulative. It is an outsourcing of power. It's a, you do it for me. They did it to me. It's never my fault, right? Listen, please. Keep your ears open. I know you're having your own thoughts and your own feelings right now. Please listen to what I'm about to tell you. It's very important. The victimhood narrative. It's never my fault. It's all, all my problems, everything I do, it happened to me. I'm the victim, the ultimate victim. Nobody experienced pain like me. I have a unique pain. I tell you, it's narcissism. Pure, bloody narcissism. Everybody did it to me. I have no agency. I never had any agency. And so the solution must come from outside as well. All, all, all of the problem was from outside in. So now I demand all of the solution be outside in as well. That's a victimhood narrative. You say, hey, I'm human. I'm human. I'm a dumb human, just like you, just like him, just like her, just like everybody else. That's stuff I'm working on because, you know, life sucks and uh, it can be hard. And then we develop these weird uh, coping mechanisms and responses to the fact that it's hard. Kind of sucks, but like, that's just, I have to brush my teeth every day. I have to clean my body every day. I have to do my meditations all the time. I have to go to the gym. Whatever you do to upkeep your body, you have to do to upkeep your mind and your emotions. It's not that complicated. It's normal. It's just normal. It's just normal life. You could be choosing to go drink and gamble and, and, and spank yourself silly over prawn. Will I get away with saying that? I will do. You can say prawn on YouTube or snorting Coke or getting in fights or whatever, but you're not, you're here listening to a long winded, uh, a video like this, trying to find solutions. So bravo, most won't, most don't. Your fellow humans are just getting drunk. Your fellow humans are just smoking cigarettes or whatever it takes to give a temporary relief from that pain, but you're looking for something else. So there I will give you a pat on the bottom, just the one. Enjoy it because that's all you get because I am miserly.
you're here and you're trying and that's good enough. It's good enough for me. It should be good enough for you. That is the polar opposite, morally speaking, to deliberately, insidiously coercing people's emotional responses to gouge them and manipulate them into giving you stuff through sympathy. That's a victimhood narrative. That's a victimhood narrative. Nobody, nobody who really is steeped in a victimhood narrative can stand to watch me. And that is very deliberate. I get feedback all the time from people like, oh, I know somebody, they really hate you. I know this person, they really, really hate you. There could be perfectly legitimate reasons why they hate me. That, that's, that, that also happens. But people who are steeped in a victimhood narrative loathe my content because I learned a couple of years ago how to pitch things and put messages in that provoke people who are insisting that there's some sort of uh, magical uh, psychic star flower because they had a hard childhood like everyone else did. It's low-key, low-grade narcissism. It's low-key, no, low-grade narcissism. I don't like use, overusing the term. I don't want you guys to overuse the term, but that is what it is. I'm, it's fundamentally saying, no, 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 I'm special. You're not. I'm not special. You're not special. Nobody here is special. Can you live with that? Like, if you can't, tss, 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 go away. Go away. I don't care if I have 10 subscribers. I don't care if I get five views per video. If I knew that those were 10 good people, five good views from really good humans, I'd keep going. I don't need it. I'm not interested. I'm not interested in all this. I wish I could swear torrent of misinformation and garbage that is designed to make people feel good and validate a pre-existing worldview. Defecate on that. Defecate on that from on high. You are not engaged in a victimhood narrative when you tell yourself the truth that you're in pain. You are not playing the victim card when you stop yourself and say, in the situation I'm in right now, I don't feel good. I don't feel like I belong here. I don't want to be around this person. I don't want to watch this YouTube video. I don't want to be in this club. I don't want to be in this house. I don't want to be in this relationship. I don't want to be in this situation for whatever reason. We can call it childhood trauma, PTSD, CPTSD, blah, 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 whatever you want to call it. You don't feel good. Okay. So leave if you can. So just say, I don't like this. It doesn't feel good. I don't want to do this. That's fine. That's fine. That's not playing the victim. You have needs, you have wants, you have a style. You don't have to copy me, you don't have to copy the person next to you. You don't have to set your standard by other people. What, what are you going to do? All you're going to do, if you set yourself by the standards of other people, you're creating an infinite scope for beating yourself up because you're always going to be below the standard of somebody for something, somewhere. This is narcissistic logic. This is the, the logic of an abuser. They set up standards that they don't hold themselves to, by the way, and then apply them to you, totally unrealistic, unreasonable standards that they know they are, and then beat you with them. Well, we all fall below standards. We all, all fall below standards. All of us fall below standards of, upon multiple vectors. Just choose another vector. Like, this person is a chess playing uh, neurosurgeon who's an amazing MMA fighter and is also vegan and also recycles and does charity work. And well, you just find a vector where they're not very, where they suck and beat them with that. Great. Narcissistic abuse and the, the logic of the inner critic, the logic of a, of a, a, a hijacked, traumatized uh, superego as Freud would have had it, is the same. It's exactly the same. It's an internal abuser. It's holding you to standards of perfection that nobody has. I started this video talking about young men because I can hear in these young men there's something they're not saying, which is, Richard, they're saying, they're looking at me and my craggy face, and they're saying, you are older than me, and you seem to be a man, and you seem to have your shit together. I am a young man raised on social media where you were not Mr. Gen X, 
and I want guidance because I feel like if I have mental hashtag mental health issues, I'm not really a man. And I think it's the same for women as well. They feel like they're not really doing a good job of being a person, but all of that is crap. It's all crapola. It's the superego. It's the inner critic using narcissistic logic to beat you up with something. What is this man you're trying to be like? Who is he? Does he ride a horse? Does he squint into the sunset? Who is this guy? Is he a samurai? Is he a cowboy? Who is this, this vision of a man or this vision of a woman or this vision of a perfect human? Who? Who are you talking about? Look at the humans in your locality. See how chaotic and fragile and frail they are. That just times that by a few billion. That's humanity. There's no superheroes here. There's no superheroes here. There's just people. Don't believe the inner critic when it says to you, if you are working on something or you have a need or you need to say no or you need to leave or you're not comfortable or everybody wants to go to the club and get drunk and you don't like that, you, you like to do something else, that there's something wrong with you. And if you admit it and say, I don't want to do that, that that's you playing the victimhood narrative. No, it isn't. Forget the victim card. Unless you are going out of your way to manipulate the feelings of other people, to gouge resources and time and attention from them that they otherwise wouldn't want to give you, you're not engaging in a victimhood narrative. You're not playing the victim card. You are simply and in a frankly responsible way giving feedback to yourself that you need help with something. Look at strength training. Like, if you were missing something in the chain of strength, do you think people who are deeply into strength training are like, oh, I'm missing, like, uh, somewhere in my kinetic chain is really weak? Oh, I know. Uh, the, the right thing to do is just ignore it and just hope I'm going to get stronger magically somehow. No, they admit that there's a problem and they fix it. They do it in sport. They do it in the military where lives are at stake. You know, in the military, if you're, uh, uh, I was going to say on active duty, I think even an exercise, even an exercise, not even on active duty, if you have an injury and you don't declare it, you can be punished very severely for that. If I break my ankle on an operation and I don't say, and then for some reason it creates a problem, like, so it's like half broken and then I fully break it, I'm, I could kill people. I could cause people to die, people who are now trying to save me because I didn't say uh, you can look this stuff up. If it's the simplest principle is uh, I, I first realized this when I was looking at uh, uh, people who uh, got in deep trouble in the Navy because they let themselves get sunburned. And I was like, they, they got arrested for it by the military police. And I was like, why, why would you, why would you do that? Because they've done something that makes them as part of an active system They've taken the, the, the parts of the active system, they are out of action. If you have a problem, you must say, at least to yourself, that's not playing the victim or, or engaging in a victimhood narrative. Victimhood narrative is deliberate and it's a manipulation. Simple as that. I think I answered that question. I think I smashed that question into the ground, into dust, then dug up the place where it used to be, <laughs> turned it into a latrine as our good Lord, Jehovah wanted us to do against the Philistines or someone. Right, let's take some questions. If you don't start asking questions, I'll start singing. It's not an empty threat. T Taurus says, smashed. Rawr. Grr. They definitely squint into the sunset. Yes. If you make it a... a one sentence long and ended a question mark. I will quick fire them. I am part cat lion. Good. Lucas said, is crunk dead? I not in my heart, sir. Not in my heart. Pickle says, Oh, I definitely spanked myself. Silly. See the serious part of this is over. Now we will have, <laughs> this is why I like my followers. Like, okay, that was serious. Now let's talk nonsense. Will we make a comeback? Says Millie Vanilli. If you learn to sing and stop blagging people, maybe. Is there a method to refill emotions, Mr. Clark? Don't make me feel the emotion of hurt and brokenheartedness. Don't hurt my feelings. 
Yes, there's a way of refeeling emotions. It's called the emotional literacy exercise. If you want to know more about that, you can go over to my channel that is called the Fortress Mental Health Protection System. And uh, there are step-by-step uh, -step exercises there to help you uh, become more emotionally literate again. Nicole Lagrange says it's good to be a victor, isn't it? Rather than a victim. I don't know. I have no idea. As John Lennon said, love isn't the answer. Love is the answer. Narcs have a twisted concept of love. That is the truth. I don't think John Lennon said that. I wish he had, though. <sighs> In the beginning of recovery, oops. Uh, the narcissistic fog kills you. Can narcissistic abuse to the point where you can die? Thank you for all you do. My therapist told me about you. Oh, thank you. Uh, I would think uh, if if it triggered other issues uh, and and not directly, not directly, you would have to then go back to being addicted to something and go back into sort of a, a lifestyle that caused a slow death. Otherwise we're talking about psychopathic abuse. Katie Scharf in the beginning of recovery, don't you have to process being victimized? Yes. Hence being a victim. Yes. Then the reveals how to shift out of victim mentality. It, you don't, you don't need to engage in a victimhood narrative. I was very careful with my words in order to recognize that you have been the victim of something. Let's take a couple more questions. Richard Granin says, Rakeem Tate, are you going to keep this up? Oh, yes. Get used to it. Jessica Adele asks, WTF is wrong with me? I was in a relationship where when my partner rejected me, I wanted him so badly that when he wanted me, I could see all the bad and push them away. This would be a good thing to uh, see a qualified mental health professional about. Have a good old chat with them. Uh, it's very common. Uh, lots of people go through this. Um, but I don't want to give you just a trite answer here. That's not going to help you with your life. Uh, find a qualified mental health practitioner, a, a counselor or a psychotherapist. Uh, do a few sessions with them and they will help you. From the windows to the walls till the sweat drops from my personage. So what if you have wrinkles? They have biotin and collagen and vitamin D3. I don't have wrinkles. He said, looking vaguely like a testicle. <laughs> oh, dear. Oh, you've got me doing it now. Will you share what you work on personally? Yes. In my book, A Cult of One by Richard Granon, uh, I, I talk about some of that stuff. It's now available as an audio book, by the way. Kathy Renick, can we do any good trying to influence a family member to get help? And what's the best strategy? That's tricky. That's tricky. Uh, you can't force people to go to therapy. You know, you can suggest it once or twice, and then I think you kind of have to leave it. Uh, I'll take two more questions and we'll go on with our day, won't we, ladies and gentlemen? We're going to have a good day. Leslie Guy says, buy my book. Yes. Is there anything that the Stoics have to offer that you like? Yes, yes, yes. Uh, it's fine. Stoic philosophy is fine. I just like ragging on it because I don't, I don't, I don't find it as wonderful as everybody else does. I think it's tea and biscuits for the middle classes. How many Stoics were slave owners? The Stoics were not revolutionaries. Here's the Stoics. If you drink wine, but not too much, you can enjoy revelry with your friends. But if you drink too much, you'll have a hangover the next day. Find the middle path. Oh, oh, wow, wow, wowee. Is there any more advice you have for us that just maintains everything exactly just as it is? I just don't find it. I don't know. I, it doesn't impress me. It doesn't impress me. Then people go, you're reading the, what, the wrong one. Stop reading Seneca. Read Marcus Aurelius. Yeah, it's slightly better, but everything that he says i'm just like and what and what where's the revelation here 
whether they don't shout too loud nor speak in a whisper find the middle it's like really really and everything just keeps everything exactly as it is dreadful dreadful middle class people like it a lot have you noticed that comfortable middle class people love stoicism it's fine it's fine the, see that part of stoicism that, that where it joins up with with zen buddhism where they say or it is it is implied it is implied instead of increasing one's lust for pleasure and one's ability to gratify pleasure reduce the desire for pleasure and be happy with less in a sort of a zen way that, that, that kind of thing I, I i vibe with i think i think it's very good don't take anything i i, I haven't slacked to put stoics off for a while i'm usually just doing that to wipe people up because people who like stoic philosophy are so thin-skinned you can't do that to nietzscheans you can't wind up people who are into nietzsche the same way because they're, they're too sardonic sardonic you talking about you cheeky you're just a taxi driver lad. don't be using all mad long words nah leslie guy says me too i've never caught dick live before mm -hmm. <laughs> oh dear uh katie would you okay serious face would you change add anything about the emotional literacy or emotional flashback course since you created them a while ago uh uh, uh not no not in principle the principles are sound the principles are really good i mean you know people talk about shadow work and jungian individuation but nobody knows shadow work isn't something that jung ever said individuation is not something he ever gave us a script for emotional literacy is a great way of bridging the gap between the conscious and the unconscious i also suspect that it allows you to practice the recollection of emotion and memory to a nuance that nothing else will you're doing it very deliberately so you're very deliberately picking up a memory and saying what specific nuanced detailed emotions are attached to this and for reasons too long-winded to get into here i think that's very very good practice in terms of recovery from anything whether you're grieving whether you're dealing with anxiety depression whatever it is oh red scout says yes i'm satin i'm sorry for letting you all down naughty satin sally greenhouse says dbt is running groups and you use a workbook it is definitely not the therapy that granin is availing himself of to be sure I love it. People know more about other people on the internet than they know about themselves. What certainty? Where do you buy your certainty from? Did you get it from the Azda? What about complex trauma? Tell me more, please. No, for God's sake. What do you want from me? It's bloody five to midnight here. Go and read Complex PTSD from Surviving to Thriving by Pete Walker. It's a great book, easy to read, and you will learn everything you need to know. John Anderson is here. Question, have you recognized how followers of Self-Aware Narcissist on YouTube? Huh? What's this question going, Frodo Baggins of the Shire? Engage in a kind of codependency by proxy with the hosts of standing partners. <laughs> you frightened me. <laughs> uh, I, I uh, would say that the followers of all... Um, you know, internet gurus or celebrities or whatever do in, end up engaging in a, a kind of codependency by proxy with a host of standard partners. Isn't that called a parasocial relationship? I can't remember what that's called. But yes, it's common, but not just with the narcissism community. Is there a difference between heartbreak and shock? Yes, I think so. Do you plan to do business courses soon? Yes, I do. I was just talking about that literally just now. I will. I will. I'm ready. Everybody's ready. Oh, you're going to catch me out. Soul Kitchen, what do you think about Gabor Mate's book, The Myth of Normal? I just tell everybody I love Gabor Mate because I like all of his YouTube interviews and I like pretty much everything he's ever said. I'm like, that's very good. 
How many of his books have I read? None. <laughs> I haven't read. Uh, you know the classics of like trauma and CPTSD? I haven't read any of them. I've tried. Oh, no, that's not true. I read the drama of the gifted child. But you know the ones that everybody recommends. I didn't read them. Why didn't you? I don't, I don't know. Sorry. I'm interested in the business courses. Good. Never heard of him. How dare you? Really? You've never heard of Gabor Mate? You're in for a treat. Have a little uh, YouTube, YouTube Gabor Mate interview. He's brilliant. The Narcissistic Fog Kills. Thanks for the book resource. My husband is a narcissist. Been married for 23 years. Thank you for your help. You're very welcome. I'm glad to help. DBT is not for CPTSD. Judy Miller never conducted DBT groups. I never. I don't know who Judy Miller is. I never said she conducted it. Sally Greenhouse, mate, you you're falling out with yourself. You know, you're saying you're arguing with things that I never said. That maybe the voices in your head are saying, but I never said that. Uh, DBT can be used for CPTSD because. Many people who are diagnosed with BPD do not have BPD. They have CPTSD. Gabor is awesome. He is. Yeah. Leslie Guy says, I'm going to check him out. Do that. You're in for a treat. Judy Herman. Yes, that's right. It was not developed for CPTSD. That's right, Sally. Uh, Stroman said, Judy Miller was an English professor at my uni. All right. <laughs> Judy Herman. She's not usually called Judy Herman, Sally. I mean, I like being familiar with people. It's I, it's Judith Herman. It's Professor Judith Herman. I've never heard her called Judy Herman before. <laughs> Have you seen our oh, Judy? Where's Judy? She's writing one of them papers on, uh, on CPTSD again. I know her. Oh, that's great. Is that why? You, is that why you call her Judy? Because you literally know her. So, so you do know her from the pub. Fair play to you, Sal. Set tell her I said hello. Very impressed. Good old Judy says Carlo. Judy, judo. <laughs> call her judo. <laughs> Where's Judy, La? Sally says Sally's Harvard. Harvard. Yeah, yeah. That's great. And uh, this has completely devolved. I like it when it starts structured and it has meaning and purpose and then it just goes mad. I, but I prefer it when people there. Uh, the last the last thing is, uh, what do you call it? Film references, just mad, mad film references. Have you ever taken the joins? Because nobody watches, by, by the way. Like people watch usually the first twenty percent of a YouTube video, so you're pretty safe just having pandemonium at the end. You could do you could do whatever you want now. Even the view counts going down now. That people are looking at this going, I think all the good all the good has, has disappeared. <laughs> Here you go, Sally's back. Some of us who listen to you do have graduate training. That's awesome, Sal. That's really cool. That do do you actually call your professor Judy though? Oh, that's a serious question. Just say yes, Judy. Is she known as Judy around Harvard? Are you are you at Harvard? You're at you're at Harvard studying under Judith Herman and you're on air arguing with me. <laughs> uh, I like catching loopy you, especially when you're with Danny. Oh yeah. Vanessa, no way, I'll stick around to the bloody end. That is a rock solid codependent attitude, that that's just loyalty. Loyalty for no reason. And I, I'm, I'm here for it, mate. I'm here for it all day. Sally's back. Yes, she is known as Judy. God bless you, Sal. God bless you. Thank you uh, for tuning in, Sally, and for, for letting me know. Uh, Ellen says, I'm out. Listen, I don't blame you, Ellen. I would have left about 20 minutes ago. Uh, I'm not at Harvard now. I taught psychoanalytic theory and practice there. That's awesome. That's really cool. I, uh, I I tried to join a master's program for psychoanalytic theory at the University of Central London. And uh, the professor there said that I couldn't because I was too old and that I wouldn't, I'd been out of university for too long and that I wouldn't know how to write papers anymore. I'm not making that up. I wish I'd screen recorded it. It was a hilarious 
interview. I think she just seen my YouTube channel and was like, fuck, let's get rid of him. Can we have a sing along? Uh, you can. Your, uh, Richard, your accent is very similar to Tom Hardy. He must have a Scouse accent as well. Listen, I'm going to fall out with you in a minute. He's from a different city. He's, he's, he's from London. He's from down south. He can do a Scouse accent. And he's mates with uh, he's mates with some of my mates up in up in Liverpool because he, he does the refereeing for some charity boxing gigs. Um, uh, Lawrence Kenwright and uh, uh, Bernie Jim, the Jim brothers, uh, run a martial arts studio there. I think they're mates with him. Um, so he does go up to Liverpool, and I'm sure he's an actor. He can do a Scouse accent, but he's he's from, I think he's from South London. Yeah. How do you calm down? I'll do you, you you calm down. You tell me to calm down. You calm down. Uh, uh, um, deep breathing usually does it. Deep breathing usually does it. Uh, did you know Scylla Black, Richard Granite? No. <laughs> Do you do a daily practice? Uh, are you crying or snotty? I'm crying inside. These are just on process tears that are just blocked up in my nose. So Susan said, the professor said that. Jesus, you're too old. She was afraid. Just think, well, at the time I was 38 and I'm looking at her and she's 58 and she's a professor on the course and she's like, you're too old to write papers. I'm like, not 20 years older than me. What do you mean? What does that what does that mean? She did not like me. She did not like me. Never mind. Never mind. It, it wasn't to be, but I did. It looked like an amazing course. What are you reading at the moment? And this is where we'll finish. This is where we'll finish. Uh, I just read uh, The Passenger by Cormac McCarthy, which is a good book for followers of this channel. It's a book about uh, me serious mental health, uh, psychosis, psychotic delusion, uh, genius fighting with psychotic delusion. Um, it's about uh, conspiracies, Oppenheimer. Uh, it's set, I think it's still set in like the same sort of time and space and the same world as No Country for Old Men. So I think it's like 1979, 1980 America. And uh, it ends pleasantly, the book. Uh, without without spoilers, just geographically, the book meanders towards the beautiful island of Ibiza and Formentera, which was a nice surprise. Right now, though, I finished that. I'm reading "Life, Life and Fate" by Vasily Goodman, uh, who was a Russian journalist in the Soviet era, uh, bringing together. It's a, it's fictional, but it's based on true stories. Bringing together a bunch of stories uh, from the Russian perspective of World War Two including the experiences of Russian Jews um, who are being rounded up by the Germans. Um, it's a good book so far. Some of it's hard to read. Um, I'll do a reading for from it, actually, over on my Richard Grant Philosophy channel sometime over the next week. But that's what I'm reading at the moment. Well, I think we covered a lot of good ground there. It was good in the beginning. God knows where it went to at the end. I would say I'm sorry, but I'm not. I'm not sorry. Uh, and I hope that you enjoyed it and that, that it was at least the beginning part was <laughs> well spent. And we, we met um, a friend of, of uh, Professor Judith Herman, who also taught psychoanalytic theory at Harvard, and we learned that Professor Judith Herman's called Judy on the campus, which is pretty cool, really. And for those who don't know, Judith Herman is the founder the originator of the concept of complex post-traumatic disorder, I think in a paper she wrote in 1992. So I often reference Pete Walker, but the concept of complex post-traumatic stress disorder is from Judith, who we will now call Judy Herman. Ladies and gents, thank you very much for your time and for your attention. And I look forward to speaking to you again very soon. Cheers. <laughs>